really my pleasure to be here today. And uh, I promise, you know, at this point in time, I will not show you any equations. I will not show you any sophisticated plots, but I can guarantee you there's some so pretty sophisticated work behind uh, what we will show. What I want to talk about is, as Steve uh, just alluded to, is uh, how do we address this data silos, those uh, cylinders of excellence, how we called them uh, earlier today, to really address the main challenge that we have to improve patient outcomes while reducing costs. I mean, Michael Porter already uh, claimed 10 years ago that we, we really need to look at this challenge end to end, and we need a data platform uh, underneath that to really make that work. So what I have today for you is really kind of hopefully a pretty compelling suggestion how we uh, want to address this uh, with the federated and uh, federated and conquer approach. Federation was al has already been mentioned, has been shown uh, just now in a research setting. We want to take this actually a little bit broader and uh, talk about how we can together generate a virtual circle of health information sharing. Before I go there, let me just uh, allow me please to say a few words about SAP. Uh, we have been mentioned already a couple of times, but uh, you might not all be familiar with our work. Um, so our headquarter is in uh, Germany, uh, close to Heidelberg. Uh, we have a lab here in uh, Palo Alto. Uh, actually, we have facilities across the world. Uh, 20 million users uh, are using our systems. Uh, pretty impressive that, you know, behind the scenes we are touching about 76% uh, of the revenues, uh, the transactions that are happening uh, globally. About 8,000 healthcare customers in 88 countries uh, are our customers. Um, so in that regard, uh, there's a, uh, definitely a significant uh, footprint. What is not on the slide, but pretty important to our story today is that uh, we are also running the largest networks with the Ariba procurement network. Uh, if you just look at the exchange that is happening via this network, the, the transactions, this is the largest network uh, in the world, which is actually larger than uh, uh, Amazon, eBay, and Alibaba combined. So in that regard, um, we came up last week. We actually announced uh, here in Orlando uh, and the uh, SAP Connected Health Platform. We are very excited about uh, this uh, uh, possibility to make a contribution really to overcome this uh, challenge with uh, the data silos. So full disclosure, when I did my PhD back uh, late 80s, beginning of the 90s, uh, and has been mentioned earlier today already, it was really about coming up with some hypothesis, some assumptions, and uh, developing a, a model. And then I had to design experiments, run the experiment, and then really analyze the data. And then e uh, either I had to go back all the way to square one, or basically had to refine my model to come up uh, with uh, the next generation, uh, with the next set of uh, experiments. That was pretty time, time consuming, especially developing the model uh, and uh, doing the experiment. That at the time, uh, late 80s, beginning of the 90s, there were already pretty sophisticated uh, machine learning algorithms around, but it was mostly about artificial intelligence, which was mostly about heuristics that have been, uh, have been used to explain the world, to explain the, the observations. That has completely changed in the meantime, and you can see here this little lake, uh, which really should indicate uh, what happened in the meantime. Digitalization really generated data lakes in the meantime. And um, again, probably you could say that uh, this started around uh, the year 2000. Uh, at the time, uh, you know, when we did the first uh, genome affirmatrix uh, chips came around, um, I have here with me uh, uh, the, f the f uh, world's first commercial lab on a chip system. At the time, I introduced that with uh, Eula Packard. Um, I w actually, this was a startup uh, here, Caliper Technologies in Palo Alto, that uh, developed the base patterns and the technology uh, behind this. So, in the meantime, you can actually have those lab on a chip devices on the single pill and uh, they are sending uh, data to your uh, to your smartphone uh, at a time and uh, the, the system is still there it's the Ashland 2100 bioanalyzer it's the entire box with power supplies that you need to, uh, to really operate uh, such a chip we have next generation sequencing we have all kinds of sensor data uh, today available uh, we are working with Roche for example to take the blood sugar measurement uh, measurements from the echo check device all of this now comes together and it 
provides the basis for uh, really to change the way how you, uh, you find new insights. Um, we already discussed a very prominent example uh, this morning, which we also discussed last week, sepsis, for example. And you go in with a, with a completely different mindset, more discovery mindset. You know, let's take a look at the data. Let's make sense out of the data. You sh uh, should be open uh, looking at the data to, to come up with, uh, with completely new insights. But in reality, if we look at healthcare and if we look at uh, what is happening in, uh, in, in, in other industries, recently an investor said, you know, healthcare is really lagging two decades behind. And why is that? I mean, it's, 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 I mean, it's really an interesting situation. You know, we have uh, vehicle insights where we actually can connect cars. We can health, uh, sorry, car insurance plans are basically changed and set up based on real data. We, have, we can do predictive maintenance for cars. But in a way, you know, uh, f if we look at uh, human beings, you know, we are still uh, somehow lagging behind. We're doing, we can enable digital farming, where basically the uh, data, GPS data, soil data, weather data is really used to, to uh, optimize the harvesting process. So you can ask the question, why is healthcare lag lagging behind? And there are a number of reasons. Uh, some of them has been uh, discussed already uh, here. Obviously, the data is complex. And that is a huge challenge. And uh, we have uh, taken uh, first steps uh, to really address that, uh, address that challenge, being able to ingest uh, complex heterogeneous data from, 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 EMR, from EMR systems. So there's a uh, consortium of Epic customers here in the US. Um, also, if you look at the, uh, what we are doing uh, with ASCO, we'll come back uh, later to that. We are able to ingest data from those, uh, from those different systems and overcome some of that complexity. Intent incentives is a big uh, topic. How do you provide incentives for, uh, to really share data? Kathy really spoke about this uh, quite a bit, and it's very good to see that now there are strong efforts underway uh, to, really, uh, to really make that happen. Transparency is not always wanted in, 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 in such a situation, so in, uh, in, in healthcare. A, a core reason why, again, we see less of, uh, of an adoption uh, in that regard. Also, you need to keep in mind, and examples have been shown uh, during the last uh, day and a half already, that once you take data out of context, it's very difficult to make sense out of the data. That's why we want to push out the, the possibility to turn data into information to the front line. That's what we mean fed federation. You can do this first step at front line where you really have understand the data. And then once you, know, you have uh, you know, turned this into information, then you should be able to share that. So um, maybe we take a moment and learn from other industries. What is, how are others doing this? Uh, how can we come, uh, how can we establish this uh, virtuous uh, circle? And one learning from Facebook, uh, I mean, we're all very familiar with that. Um, the, uh, the, the benefit that we give to the individual to share data really is the possibility to get some visibility, get positive feedback from, from, from all your friends that, that you have in Facebook. It's enough incentive to then really uh, basically motivi motivate us to share uh, some of our data, which then in turn can be used to do precision advertisement. Okay, so now think about that concept and translate that. Um, so uh, what we have to do in healthcare, provide a strong incentive to share the data. And uh, what we're doing here, th there's this uh, positive feedback loop. So why don't we take that for a second and uh, translate this uh, into, uh, the, into healthcare and basically give the physician the possibility to get feedback from a very large informed database, a learning system uh, to then for their specific uh, treatments so that they have the right insens, uh, insights how to treat their patients. They can make sure that they are uh, treating the patients according to the right, uh, right guidelines with the highest efficacy possible with uh, the least uh, side effects. So that's what we are proposing. That's what we are doing with ASCO. That's what we are building there. The American Society uh, for Clinical Oncology uh, established, uh, established canceling. We are building this wall to wall then really to provide the participation, uh, participating physicians the possibility to learn from that uh, database and be informed by this, uh, by this database. And again, uh, talking about about precision health, here we are really talking about a million uh, patient records which will be in the system uh, this year, which then can be used to inform those decisions. 
So with that, I want to come to the key, ingredi key ingredients uh, for such a network. Um, really, uh, first of all, the platform needs to be open. There need to be APIs. There need to be microservices behind the scenes that really manage the mechanics uh, of the exchange. You need the statistical power, uh, which means you need to have a very large database. And think of it. Today, what we are doing in clinical trials, we are only taking in 3% of the, the patient population. And by the way, this, there's a strong bias within this uh, uh, pre-selection of this uh, population. So you want to learn from all the other 97% of the patients. That's what we can do with many of those real-world evidence platforms uh, such as CancerLink. You want to provide that feedback loop so that everybody has that incentive to join and share data. And you need to have a 360 degree understanding. With that, I also want to highlight the work that we are doing here in Stanford. Um, so really breakthrough capability, breakthrough application that we built uh, together with uh, you and Ashley's team. We are very grateful uh, for this uh, collaboration and co-innovation. For the first time, you can bring here together genomic, clinical, and variable data, which then uh, allows the, the geneticists um, to really understand the, the how pathogenic the different uh, genetic variants are. And you do this, and you allow to do this in an interactive way. In order to do that, you need to have a high-performance database. This is our in-memory technology, which is behind this, which enables those capabilities, which allows this continuous moni monitoring and this clinical report generation in an inter interactive fashion. So if we Combine it all together. We saw the, the federation approach for research um, in, the, in the previous talk. Um, as a matter of fact, we are talking about an entire health ecosystem. There are different stakeholders around the patients. And uh, really what we want to enable is the exchange between those uh, different uh, stakeholders. Um, we want to uh, be a we want to provide a platform so that health related information can be in shared across uh, the different organizations across the data silos and even within those uh, different uh, um, stakeholders that are uh, shown here there are different uh, data silos again which we can and want to bridge that's really what we want to do that's part of our mission to improve people's lives thank you very much <laughs>